Hi there, I'm Ishil Anmani reporting for Kids First. Today I'm very excited to speak with Jack Peter Mundy, the director of the new feature film Prototype. Jack okay. studied film at Christ Church University in Canterbury, and in 2017 he formed his company Film Everything and directed his first short film Parallel. More recently, he's focused on cinematography and directing roles for feature films. So thank you so much, Jack, for speaking with me today. No, it's nice. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So let's get started with how did you get the idea for Prototype? Well, I have to be completely honest. I never had the idea for Prototype. I was brought in at the last minute. Um, I'd been, I had a, I've had a background in uh, cinematography and I've uh, been a cinematographer for, I think, at that point, about 10, 10, 12, 15 films, something like that. Um, and this was in the middle of, um, we got to the point where middle of COVID. So people were, you know, pulling out of projects, projects were stalling, things were sort of really tricky. Um, but at the same time, the um, sort of uh, um, independent film uh, industry was doing pretty well because we were able to be smaller productions. We were able to get into different locations where bigger productions had to completely shut down. We were able to sort of sneak in with much smaller units. Um, and I was brought in sort of with a couple of weeks um, to go to direct and DOP prototype. So I didn't really have much of the background that would normally have as a director. And this was the first time I was directing a feature film. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire, not only directing, not only being the director of photography, not only having two weeks notice, um and uh getting to know the cast getting to know the script getting to know the story working out my ideas um plus the global pandemic <laughs> which was happening at the same time um and so that meant that we luckily we didn't lose any cast but we were still having crew that would like would have a couple of days with um, a member of crew and then they would have to self-isolate and then we'd have to get new crew in and so we'd have that whole process of learning people you know sort of you know that that first couple of days is always awkward but have that period over and over and over again with new people it was really hard but um but yes i'd love to say that I had the idea for prototype and we developed it for ages but um as soon as i read sam's script um i completely understood what it, what he was trying to say i mean although it's a um a sci-fi film and you can certainly look at the artwork and it's all about the robots um, i very much think it's a it's a family film at the end of the day um, it's about a family unit, and I think it's very much more a truthful telling of what it's going to be like in the future. Um, I think, you know, we're going to look at um, robots and, and this sort of AI and different technology coming into our homes. Um, and I don't think necessarily it's going to be like flying cars and, you know, we'll all be sitting on our, in our space suits and it being so futuristic. I think it's going to be much more subtle. I think if you look back even 100 years, the 1920s, people in the 1920s would still recognize our homes. You would have a lounge and you'd, you know, you'd have a fireplace and, you know, have a kitchen. People aren't going to be like, oh my God, what's happening in a hundred years. So this is very much more a, a, a modern telling of, of what it's like to be with technology coming in. That's just then becoming part of people's environments. Um, well, I think the, uh, the good thing about any type of project like this is that you can take any, you can take, you can take a lot from it, whether that's good or bad experiences. Um, this was a this was a great experience for a lot of different reasons, but there were challenges, which I think every project has its own challenges, and that may, as low budget filmmakers, it may just be lack of money, it may be lack of time, um, lack of resources. Um, but I think every film is is useful because it helps us to um, grow, and so I think every time that we make a film, we have to sort of take on board. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that type of shot again or I'm not going to work in that type of way I'm not going to as a director I'm not going to do that type of thing so every film we do we sort of grow as people um so I've done I've just finished directing my seventh uh feature film so because of the way that productions work um sort of uh this one has come to distribution sort of quite late on really it's been about 18 months in post-production and getting distribution um so it's it's funny because since then i'm looking back and going there are things that i probably wouldn't do um that i did in that film and there are things that i you know that i'm really proud of so i think it's it's, it's a great fun film um i think people have to sort of manage their expectations about what it is it's not you know it's not will smith it's not um i robot it's not running around it's not flying cars um and i think people have if people have that expectation it's always going to be a little bit disappointing but I think what this is, is very much um, sort of family dynamics. It's sort of drama, family drama. Um, it's sort of, you know, how will a family deal with technology that goes wrong in their homes in the future? 
And I think that's kind of an interesting thing. So people just need to take manage their expectation, take on board what it is, what it actually is they're watching, and hopefully they'll uh, they'll enjoy it. I think it's a it's a good fun film. So, what do you think is the most important um, and unique part of the of the project? You talked a little bit about the message and how it's a little bit different from you know what we've seen about you know, in a hundred years we're all sitting in our spacesuits. But yeah, what's what's very unique about it? Um, it's it's very yeah it's very I think that there is a lot of unique things uh, in it. I think there are a couple of things that we did. So we tried not to reinvent the wheel. I mean, there's there's a lot of common themes in here about technology going wrong. That's kind of that's I think that's an inherent human fear is that we're going to put our reliance on all of this technology. Um, and we do already, you know, I mean, I dare, I dare not even mention Alexa's name because she'll suddenly pop up and be like, what do you want? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but they're, they're always listening. You know, you, the amount of times you type into something into Google and then suddenly it'll be on all of your search, um, uh, your your um, website pages. It will be suddenly on Facebook, pops out of it. So technology is learning all the time. And it's, we've given so much of ourselves to technology. So we haven't tried to reinvent the world because these these themes are common. And I think, you know, ever since, you know, George Orwell's 1984 and the fear of the future and how it's going to be, you know, this is nothing new. Um, but at the same time, what we did try and do is sort of be current with some of our thinking. So, for example, there was a, in Sam's script, there was a, a character, Andy, who is the child in the film, mm -hmm. the youngest child in the film. And um, their their relationship with uh, the robot one is sort of the heart of the film. It's, you know, how, you know, a child of that age and around about, you know, sort of um, seven, eight years old, how they would just completely adapt to technology. But one of the elements in the film that I thought was quite, in, quite important was that, um, uh, uh, the actor, uh, Marshall, um, doesn't identify as, as male or female, he's gender neutral. And we thought, well, there's no need for the character in the film to be a male or a female child. It doesn't matter. It's not important to the film. It doesn't matter whether they're a boy or a girl. Um, and so we just took out any gender references. So they were just called they, and, um, and it wasn't sort of an important part. So we just thought, well, let's just normalize that element of the film. It doesn't matter whether they're a, they're a little boy or a little girl it's their relationship with the with the robots that is important and i think it's also relevant because the robots are gender neutral i mean although they've yeah. got a male voice or a female voice they're a robot <laughs> they're not male or female and even number two even two comes in and they like oh should we just change uh, two's voice from male to female it's as simple as that and people then it's human nature to to, yeah. to put gender on something so we thought that's a nice sort of little juxtaposition between the two. The robots are gender neutral, so therefore, why not make the child that is gender neutral gender neutral in the film? And so it's just normalizing. It's not tokenism. It's about sort of just making it sort of a not relevant point in the film. It doesn't matter whether what, what their gender is. And I think that's a nice element that we, we sort of added in. So it was trying to be current with, with our thinking, um, and I hope we did that. Yeah, I actually didn't even notice that until you said it, and I was thinking back, and yeah, I just, I just caught on to that. Wow. I say a lot of a lot of people. Like, I've, I've done a lot of interviews about this, and and some have just thought, have just been talking about a little boy. Some have just been talking about a little girl. They've just they've kind of made their decisions. But I I think it's good that right. we start to to not think about gender as as so binary. Uh, I think it, it's a much more fluid, and we're seeing a lot more of that in culture, and much more acceptance of that. And I think that's really important. And I think the more that we can expose people to that, and not make it as an issue driven thing. I mean, the center of the film is not about being gender neutral. But it is an element of the film, and I think that's nice to have those themes that people then can start to challenge people's perceptions. I think that's useful. So this is a, an independent film, um, and I mean, the production value is absolutely incredible. Um, so one thing I especially really like is how one and two were made, because it looks yep. extremely like they're, they are quite lifelike for being robots, you know, on the screen. Uh, and it's a very unique type of look. So how are they made and how are they made to look like that on screen? I think the the success of one and two comes down completely to Luke and Zoe that play one and two. They they had to endure the prosthetics, which oh. in the middle of summer was not fun for them at all. For twelve hours a day, um, it was yeah they they and it was obviously that it was just in the mosque all the time. There was very little time for them to sort of take it off and then have to put it all back on again. Um, so there their performances and expressions that come through this because they, you can't emote very much through these masks is is the selling point of the film um and i think they did an amazing job it was all body movements it was all sort of expressions some of it in their voice although we did then adr their voices i often yeah. so it did it sounded a little bit distant i know 
there's some people that have um have commented on the film and said oh the, the adr is terrible because it doesn't quite sync up with their mouths well that's the point it's you know they're not actually talking they don't have voice boxes they don't actually talk they're robots so we ADR'd all of their, um, ADR is recording the audio after mm -hmm. after the fact, um, and then put it in afterwards. So it sounded slightly off, um, because that's what, you know, technology doesn't exactly mirror what we're doing. So their performances were central to, to creating one and two. The prosthetics were, were great. Um, and one of the things that we decided that it's very hard to emote through these masks um, at the end of the day. But what we wanted to do was initially we were thinking we were going to block out the eyes or blend in the eyes. But it was so important for the characters that when you actually watch their performances, especially one, you get so much of connection between uh, Andy and one through their eye contact and their eye movement. So to then take that out completely would have just sort of ruined that performance. So we made that decision in post-production to not blend those eyes out. And I know some critics have been like, oh, you can see the, the skin beneath, beneath the eyes. I say at the end of the day, you have, to, you have to suspend disbelief to a certain extent, but I thought it was more important to get the best performances yeah. rather than to worry about how the technology works because at the end of the day there's not really robots that walk around in human form at the moment so you kind of have to suspend disbelief and hopefully the story and their performances takes you out of out of the fact that there are not really robots you know so hopefully people believe that but it's definitely luke and zoe that did an amazing job doing that and uh, and obviously the cast as a whole did a really great job as well amazing well yeah thank you so much jack for chatting with me today it's really been a pleasure it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I hope people will check it out. It's on Amazon Prime and it's on uh, iTunes at the moment, I think, in the US. Awesome. Yes, it's available now on digital Amazon Prime and iTunes. I'm Ishan Mani reporting for Kids First, signing off. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications by hitting the bell so you don't miss my next interview or those of my amazing Kids First teammates. Thank you for watching and goodbye.